Thank you very much to all of you for being here today. Thank you, Inziva, for organizing this and counting on me. Let me discuss something we consider. Well, I'm Pavel Sanemeterio. I'm half of the presentation. Roman couldn't make it, unfortunately, for professional reasons. And what we share here is just an idea we had how to disable uh, crypto lockers and malware infections. As I said, I'm Pablo Samanimeterio. I work at Telefonica. That's my email address. And that's my Twitter, PS and Nimi. Then Roman Ramirez, who is one of the co founders of Rotitcon uh, conference in Madrid, that's his email address. And he's always passionate about technology and he's fighting different struggles. And he is part of WC. That's his Twitter account. The six bullet points. First, I introduced malware progression of malware in recent years and why we started it when we started some years ago discussing this at a conference. We will talk about other projects and some work, previous work on, on the topic because we thought at first that we were the most intelligent in the, in the world and then we realized that there is people much more in, intelligent than us. And I talk about recognition techniques to detect uh, that malware uses to detect when it's been analyzed. And there are different papers that call it attentive malware or vigilante or keeping an eye or also the split personality malware that behaves when analyzed and misbehaves when it's in the environment that they want to infect. So uh, that's been it. That's a, a tool that we have and conclusions. I always like to start with a question, to lead with a question. Do you think a you're a target? Hands up. If you're in the room, it's because you think so. If you do not raise your hands, it's because you don't think so, right? Why is that? I always say something. There's two types of people, co uh, companies or, well, give, name it as you wish. Those that have been attacked and those who have not been attacked yet no, don't know that they have been attacked. Why are we attacked if we are to be unbiased? Because somehow we have the money. We have something in the account, no matter how little amount, or else we can be turned into money. What ways do maf mafias or, or the villains have to turn us into money? We had IT virus, computer virus, and malware that's gotten at our money. Nowadays, the most active one and the one affecting us individuals and companies would be crypto locker. You all know it. It's attack, it attacks. Its attack would be encrypting content into a hot desk and ask for money in exchange for the pictures and data and so your life. Now and then, in some of my seminars, I come across people who say, well, I don't care whether they encrypt my content. I don't have much important there. Nothing much. And this is men uh, who get asked, maybe you don't uh, care if the pictures are seen, but maybe your wife uh, does care. Another way to turn into money, if not by taking your money directly, is through information, information about your company. Information is power, is money. Did you know webcams are also sold in the black market? We've seen it in other presentations within the deep web you can buy cameras so boys is 10 cents women is 60 cents so information is money and the other way to monetize you would be through your platforms through your hardware your hardware can be used to release attacks on other companies or it could be used through crypto coins to generate crypto coins and save Light. This is a way to get mm, it. The Mirai attack that happened a few weeks back proves how many elements can be hired for a denial of service attack. What kind of malware is out there? Well, malware would be all kind of malicious software. When I say malicious, it's, uh, I mean that it's used for evil. We have viruses, the most classical ones. that infect other programs. 
and this way they propagate from one computer to the next. Then logic bombs that take up resources until your computer is not to be used. Then we have dialers nowadays, but back then when there was no flash uh, RAID or modems or ADS, they would change the, n the, n the number you would dial in. It was not just a regular number, but a special number that would charge you extra. Then worms, it's a kind of mal malware that self-replicates, attacking through a vulnerability and infect servers. So it tends to be a zero day attack for which there is no protection and they infect machines all over uh, the internet. The first one is from 88, the Marexa worm. Trojans, other kind of malware that pretend to be legitimate and infect your machine, get control over your machine through this program. Spying software. Spyware is some kind of malware that spies on your computer. They get your screen, webcam, passwords, screenshots, whatever you have. A bot or a bot network, botnet. This would be a com that you are the mercy of a master or a central spot where the rules are set by the master. A rootkit, which is some kind of malware that tries to hide inside the operating system, hiding processes, folders from your folder system, connections. Miners, crypto coin miners. There are kinds of mal malware that infect your machine and l generates crypto coins by having it working on a set of machines because these can be chain exchanged for dollars. This one is the predecessor to what we endure now with crypto locker. Before crypto lockers, what used to happen was that people would surf the web, they would get a screen saying, we found that your computer is infected. So buy this anti antivirus and you will get rid of the virus and people would pay for the fake antivirus. But then people learned about it and now we get crypto lockers that encrypt your hard disk and then the contents are inaccessible and a ransom is asked in exchange that grows in time by the way the longer it takes you the more you will pay and then there's been an, a progression so weak cryptography algorithms have moved into a kind of malware and encryption that is much more robust that cannot be broken into what about malware evolution or progression? I've explained different types of viruses. If you take any given virus, uh, it would fit into several of these classes, not just one. What happened in history with malware? Well, initially, this was a proof of concept where people would prove they knew how to do things or could vulnerate, break, break into systems. That was it. They did not try to hide it, conceal it, and often we would find the bug here trying to run away from all the firewall manufacturers. Uh, there was no hiding. Here you see, remember this one, the, the, the bars? Don't you remember these bars? You would get some different things such as an ambulance or a suicidal element where you would press Control S and it would be deleted from the memory, or the walker, you get a color element in on MS DOS, which is a novelty because that was not an option. But there, there was no malignant effect. And even some hard claims such as the AIDS virus, because there was not enough in research done for its cure. And then later on, can came up predecessors as well like the math virus, where a math operation was to be conducted successfully, or casino that would delete your fat, that it's the partition table where you would have all your file systems and you would have access to the files, and there you had to take a game of duck black. If you won, it would be restored, and if not, uh, you would lose it all. Ah, a hand of blackjack. They they were they were 
pressed uh, bastards, so to say. But they were not asking for money. They just uh, wanted to play a game. It's kind of the uh, roulette game, but nothing wrong about it. What happened in the turn of the century? It all changed. It was not a hobby for people trying to prove how good they were at programming or uh, debugging. And it became a business and it became professionalized and people were after money. And that's why those little worms that were chasing became true projects. Software engineering that required testing and software and everything else just to make profit. And antivirus or uh, companies don't even see those worms anymore, such as the Zood banking virus or other cases where there are other players that are not even mobs or mafias, but nation states uh, with cyber weapons such as uh, Stacknex with three zero days. And the idea was to attack um, these uh, country, said the countries, power plants or nuclear plants. Antivirus manufacturers uh, have their malware labs or the use chain. They would look into all the samples that come in and produce a signature or a um, vaccine against that malware type tend to be in uh, this kind of environment lots of monitors and experts working and breathing things as weird as you can see up there they use tools such as radari ida monitor debugger and many others that i will not mention and this is what they look into if you are not familiar this is assembler code this is the last border people and machine language and they try to analyze it and see what the malware does if you if those developing malware they realized progressively that this was reverse engineering and they were catching up on their tricks or fails and so they moved on to concealment techniques like this one you're using debuggers the assemblers that have a process suspended and debugging so instead i will use another function by microsoft to verify whether my process has been debugged or not if it is i end it and if it's not i keep running it regularly it is just a split personality behavior here what about the antivirus manufacturers the number of samples generated every quarter is around 40 million so 400,000 samples a day do you think there's any antivirus manufacturers that can endure this workload with humans because analyzing assembler codes and decide what to do it costs time and human resources so what happens taking advantage of virtualization and many other automation techniques they run the malware samples on automated uh, environments known as sandbox six that simulate environments where to run malicious codes and detect his behavior without having to scratch out the whole assembler code and if you remove at least three hundred thousand out of four hundred thousand that would be quite enough one of the most famous sandboxes is cuckoo cuckoo the villains are not alien to this kind of technology they are aware of it they use it as well and what do they develop ways to circumvent it to have that split personality in a way that when you're running it inside the sandbox you behave just as, like a kid if dad is watching i behave if not i misbehave so what did we come up with since there's lots of malware behaving like this and since this sandboxing techniques are widespread placed at the entry of email and 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 also surfing different companies so worms tend to use this anti-sandbox techniques more and more what do we think well if it's if those are disabled and and the, the when the sandbox is detected there is no split personality so what if a physical computer would behave as a sandbox? As I said, if we combine it together with sandboxing technologies or techniques, usually what we would get is 
that it will not behave uh, maliciously most of the time. Combining it with a sandbox on email and entry spot, if the virus is not split personality, if they behave regularly, it should be caught on the sandbox. As I said, Roman and myself, we thought we had the formula to coke. We were so very happy. And we started crutching and realized we're not so smart. There are many papers published before, uh, around 2008, by the way, that we're already analyzing and giving some proposals, proposals on the topic. You have Chu Shen, John Anderson, and others, 2008. Jordi Vázquez, I know him from Barcelona, 2013. Spot of the Kaspersky conference, he had this idea just directly deploying files. You know, for sandbox to use a specific files if you deploy them inside a regular uh, operating system they are there and uh, if they check the files uh, the run the execution or implementation should fail and then dr ricardo rodriguez and his colleagues in 2016 published a very interesting paper i recommend to you all with a very good malware characterization and an interesting proposal for the use of this kind of techniques I said that malware uses recognition techniques. What kind of techniques are the most used ones? I refer to one, the one when you are detecting when you're being debugged, then a virtual machine uh, detection, and then others that detect spot apps or environments that are used mostly in a malware lab by a person. Debugging. This is classical example that is uh, the check flag. This is a structure that has the flag uh, showing if it's been debugged. You can check it on the API by Microsoft. So is the debug debugger present? Check remote debugger or output debug string. Those are functions that are being used when you're developing to leave messages on and check them out later. first technique to make sure this would work and pan out. We develop a Microsoft driver, so whenever a process is started, the flag is changed and it states that it's been debugged. With output debug string, we look for this function and we replace it with one of our own, where the behavior would be similar to uh, debugging in, in, in process. In a regular behavior when debugged it will come all the way here and detect that the debugger it's been debugged because you've changed its value coming in latest value right otherwise it means that it's not being debugged what's missing here because we've gone all the way to flag so there's malware that checks the flag and lets us know if we go through api there are some part of the heap that is dynamic memory reserve that are also flagged. They are marked when a debugger starts to work. And this is what we need to do next. Malware environment detection. As I said before, reverse engineers on programs, they use a series of processes or tools that are well known, amongst which we could have a search for process name, uh, only dbg.exe, idec.exe, immunity debugger, a wireshark for traffic capture, process explorer, process, process monitor, etc. Window names, processes I can search for, but they can also be hidden. And if you have it on the window, you need to see it and you can search for them and it is visible. There are two ID for windows. In on uh, there is window class and the text it contains. Uh, for each tool, so only DBG has window class that is only DBG and text is only DBG as well. Immunity debugger has its own IDA, the same Win DBG, just the same process explorer has this process explorer and text would be process explorer as well. So they look for this kind of element inside the operating system that is running and if detected, they finished the program, the end did. And then they also use 
virtual machine recognition. How does it know that it's running on a VM? First, the features uh, it's themselves. A physical machine nowadays has memory below one giga. For virtual machines, since we still use the host operating system, we say one, two gigas, but the system has four. You will not find a machine, a physical machine now, anywhere below, below four, sorry, one giga. So you need to know the RAM memory of the machine. And if it's below one giga, it is virtual. Then number of microprocessors in, in the machine. How many machines do we have with less than two microprocessors? Not many. Even if the poorest ones, it's a double core nowadays. Then storage capacity in the hard disk. So virtual machines, we allocate 60 up to 100 gigas, not much more. So this is a different technique that is quite, quite simple to understand when it is being run in a virtual or real environment. Process names. Virtual environments. I, I don't know if you've ever run a virtual box or a, uh, VM war. They have some processes to help with these uh, simulation. The most typical ones for VirtualBox would be VirtualBox service, VirtualBox tray. VM war would be uh, OCD, MNAT, and where the HTTP. And we have Agent Pi that is quite quite specific. If you're a process and you're run on Windows and you find something that is Agent Pi. You suspect PY, you need to suspect that it might be a cuckoo, uh, cuckoo sandbox. Then you've got the window names as well. The tools for analysts have some, some specific features as part of the f windows that are typical of the VMs. You've got some windows such as a tray windows class or tool window. Another feature, oh, I forgot his name, my, my friend from Kaspersky, let's call him that. Well, this was um, file pathways. If you're running on a virtual environment, this, if it's virtual box, you will find this, files, mounts, gets, video, who, hook. This is still virtual box. If you have it here, you will have VM wall mouse or similar. And if you have the get edition tools installed so that the VM window is bigger or smaller, you will find here you've got the help elements for guests. This would be the technique using in Kaspersky's presentation. It would be a regular operating system. These are all the files inside and they would look to find out whether the malicious files were found or not. Then we have the record keys. Virtual machines leave some tracks, some, some hints on Windows registry, record, got mouse guest or service or video. They have something funny about them, and that is that apart from mapping hard disks with an ID that can be QMU, This is also linking to QMOS or VirtualBox. This is another one for hard drive. This one is quite quite specific as well, VM8-1. You also have software, Oracle, VirtualBox for additions as well. There's this one where you get the BIOS date, June 23, 23rd, 1999. Then you've got this one that is virtual box or mwa where inside windows record so machines get crashed because they have many spots uh, to see if you're real or not within windows these keys are not uh, if it's freshly installed these keys do not exist then you've got the mac address you know the first three bytes of a mac address identify vendor vendor for the network card and the same for virtual machines these first three bytes are for VirtualBox and an M1, VMware has four for its identification. Other techniques, 
that you find in some malware samples when identifying a virtual environment. It would be the equipment or the device name. Often we think, well, I'm producing a sandbox, so when Windows asks how to call it, uh, name it, so sandbox, it's an easy way for the villains to detect it. And, and it's it's sad on us. And they give us the own name or sandbox or test or virus, specific strings that are recognizable in most of the sandboxes. And then when you get to a sandbox that is an exe file or similar, the pathway it's been predefined, C sample, boot analysis, and the name is self-defined uh, or automatically defined as well. Or the hard disk name, if it's called Sandbox, you are leaving keys behind who, who, whoever wants to follow you. Then other most more advanced and twisted Elements would be using x86 instructions from the assembler to understand that you're being looked into. So it's a CPU ID. It's a valid instruction on the assembler that gives you information on what CPU is running. If it's on mware and the name is CPU ID, it would say mware, mware. If it's VirtualBox, VirtualBox, VirtualBox. If it's um, Intel, regular one, it will say Intel. That is genuine. So that's the clone. And there are some other techniques as well that are being used to detect them, such as location of the interruption table. Since these are two operating systems running, then we have the host and then another Windows system that it's an OS, virtual OS, the interruption table does not necessarily be this, can, doesn't need to be the same. And so we find techniques such as tracking down that interruption table and see where it is. And it's not just that table, but also the descriptor table with the global or local these two are also located in different direction addresses sorry as you see those development malware have a wide repertoire of techniques and tools available when detecting whether they have been tracked down so we thought of uh, building up some fake apps to simulate replicate those tools of an analyst, same name, same Windows class and Windows text to try and cheat them, to the, deceive them. These are empty windows, same icon, same name, same kind of window and same process. Let's see if they get caught. And then a driver to monitor when there's a new process on the operating system. This is the function, create process of notify routine. And for each, we have a flash debug on true, sorry, debug flag on true, and then a DLL is injected that I call sandboxing because it tends to be a DLL that also tries to find malware to see if that program has a, a sandbox. Said DLL, that I will inject on what uh, the process I create hooks all the necessary functions to simulate registries, records, and files inside the process to deceive it. This function you can check it on the document by Microsoft. It is on the official site, and there you set the address for the noti notice routine, and you add it or remove it when a process is created. Then, on the other hand. This function, basically what it does inside driver would be to get the process, find out where the environment log is, if found, they move on, see if it's debugged, and if it's not being debugged, there is flag, so debug flag would be one, and then detaches from the process. Then there is other function within the driver to monitor when the DLL mapping as part of the process. And why is that? Because when injecting a NETA function that is this library, this flag li library that might not be always on the same address because of ASLR. If we find a DLL, if it's the one I want, I just save the address to send it and inject the DLL into the process that has just been created. Then, the load driver has a process that first 
opens false apps and then sets the driver in. When setting a false app, this is a list. And if I want to enlarge it and add a tool that is not there, I just need to add it there so that it's completed. And here you see, that's where the DLL is injected. It, there's been a new process created, the driver calls the user space, and that's where the whole DLL injection process happens. As part of the process, well, DLLs once injected, they always have some kind of a hidden initial main, and that's where we will run the whole patching process to cheat, to deceive. Here you see how I hook the output function for the bucket stream. I find both calls, ASCII or white characters, and I get a function that just gets out. That's it. The source function, well, the error value would be changed and could be detected. And finally, for instructions, as I said, it is the most twisted side of it. Initially, we saw this DBI, or binary instrumentation, and luckily, this increases the payload and the performance goes down. So it's not operational, it's not efficient, but at least helps us understand that this CPU, that's uh, where it's running, is genuine, it's a good one. And when you're running on a virtual box, if it, um, War, war, in EM, BM, war, where, and you get different instructions, and to see what happens when you implement changes. And I will now move to a demo, see how this tool works. For which I use a program already developed by Alberto Ortega called Payfish. It's become kind of a standard, uh, standard for sandboxes. And so the program, what it does is, when you're in there, good. Good. When you're using it, you send it into a sandbox, and what you try is to have all the flags, all the green checks that you see, that need to be okay, okay, okay. Since this comes from a regular machine that is mine, physical machine that is my PC, all check apps for a malware that have been found in a regular malware. But you see that Alberto added it, they've all been spotted. This is a fail, right? This is when it's been traced down. But this is because there was no mouse activity. One of the techniques used by villains as well is to have a sandbox before ch be having been changed. Well, the mouse would not move around. What regular user would not move the mouse? Well, only if they've gone for lunch, but if you're using it, you move it. And this is also mouse activity tracking. El proceso. Perdonar. I'm loading the tool now. Vale. Este proceso se encarga de cargar por un lado lo primero las ventanitas que me han salido todas a mí, una por aquí, otra por aquí. Okay, different windows. So monitor debugger, process explorer. So you see has generated all these windows. It is monitoring already and it is waiting for us to start any process. And here you see that we have a number of traces. Again, it's still the same computer, but we have just injected a DNL, DDL, and now the checks start to uh, appear. So we try to cheat it, we try to fool it. This is a virtual environment. Here we have the debugger. So this part of emulating and faking the instructions is not included there. 
Node.js, it will detect all the instructions, but you can trick, you can trick, uh, trick them all, and because it simulates that it is a virtual machine. So this tool does the GBI. This is a dynamic instrumentation of binaries, and it changes that instruction, and then it adds uh, something to be run, uh, well, before or after. So in front or at the end. So I will ask it to change all the instructions so that it runs a W where a VM where. And here we see a machine in hypervision, and this is VMware. And the other instructions for detection of virtual machines, now it's failing. So I'm pretending that I'm simulating that I, that I am a virtual machine in a real computer. OK, this is basically what we've seen. These, these these are all the detections that are made by this program of about the program that we have just run. So to conclude, we believe that this idea of simulating a real environment combined with the sandbox technology may end up stopping many attacks, primarily ransomware attacks. If we add it to any other elements, analyzing Gmail attachment, Hotmail attachment, or any email services, even those of the actual company, well, we believe that it could stop CryptoLocker attacks. If we add virus total data rules, you are making it more and more difficult for this uh, malware to get into the system. So the driver works quite well, performs quite well. It is not, uh, it does not consume many resources and doesn't do anything weird, anything strange. No blue screens anymore. Therefore, this solution has a number of risks. If a bug does not use any of the techniques, it continues to be as vulnerable as before. If your malware, despite what it is being run, because this is the case, because virtualization is more and more extended. If it kills the machine or deletes all the files, it will be detected. However, if you have a sandbox testing it beforehand, it will be detected in the sandbox, and you will not see it. You should not see it. And actually, if you want to implement a similar solution in a corporation, in a company, all the software has to be tested beforehand because you don't really want to damage the software or the proprietary development of the company as you do this. This is just an idea. This is just a draft. Lots of work is yet to be done. One of the things that we have implemented, though, as you can see here, all these checks are there. This could also be an alert for um, malware development. So we have a DLL for technology. You only simulate that you are a VM malware or a sandbox or just one thing at a time. And now, white list of processes. This will help you avoid problems in corporate applications. The suggestion that I was made at RootedCon, very interesting, is to set up an alert or a log about the um, elements that list the register and that help look for files. So therefore, if you haven't detected a bug, you may detect something else from there. And then hooking more functions, and then the detection of CPU ID, red pill, no pill, CPU ID, we know how to do it. However, performance is very low. And red pill and no pill, yes, we can also do that. And then if you are searching, you have a driver name or you have a number of DLLs, you should try to hide yourself so you are not easily found. 
and then you have to prevent yourself to defend yourself against re parching. So if you change all the features that a program called, a program may wait for some time and may go back may, to the prior features. So therefore, that's the way you stop repatching. I would like to thank Ricardo, Jordi, Jago, Alberto and Mark for their great help. I also would like to thank the malware list that I belong to. And well, now time for questions. I uh, hope that you are not asleep now. My question is about a conference I saw on YouTube about new viruses or ransomware. Apparently, they are being quite new and they, are, they install themselves on the BIOS. Can you tell us more about it? Are you aware of that at all? Right. BIOS attacks. David Barroso has a wonderful speech on the internet. You may uh, look for it. And they tell us that BIOS is a vulnerable point where you can install not only ransomware, but any um, spy software. So no matter the operating system, the number of times that you format it, you install it. So the malware, the malware will infect the BIOS because the BIOS is started before the operating system. So therefore, all the systems that I just mentioned are for the OS. Is there a way to protect yourself? I think that was the question. Yes, well, that would be twisting it a bit, but yes, well, but attacks on BIOS have always taken advantage of any vulnerability, allowing them to flash on the BIOS. So if the vulnerability is there, you don't have very much to do up until it is patched. Hello, good afternoon. Two questions. Well, three. Or doubts the app that you have uh, developed, so to speak. Imagine that you are in an environment where you have uh, virtualization, VMware, you name it, and then you run that app. So it does not overwrite or that it does not have an impact on virtualization when it simulates the locations or the register or the uh, executable files that you mentioned before. So it does not uh, step on the virtualizations. No, 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 no. The same points continue to be there. I don't eliminate those that were there. I just add others for virtualization. Okay, thank you for clearing out that doubt. Now, second doubt. Also, with regard to the app you showed us, you said that recent virus such as CryptoLocker or ransomware like based their attacks on recognition of those virtualization environments or sandbox. Does that include or do all crypto lockers do that or only the latest crypto locker versions? Well, perhaps I did not explain myself clear. So these techniques are implemented in on virtually all the malware. CryptoLocker is, uh, has campaigns that are short in time and infect everywhere around them. And they are very much aware of the increasing number of virtualized environments, of virtual, uh, virtualized environments. And now, last doubt is about the operation of CryptoLocker, performance of CryptoLocker. So when CryptoLocker infects uh, equipment, it uh, encrypts all the data, asks you for a ransom, and they're going to say, okay, you log on to Tor network, and then you make your payments in Bitcoins so that you cannot really find the origin, the origin. So when someone is doing something bad and you ask him for money, I say, where is that money? Where is that money? Or where is that money going to? If you track the uh, route or the journey of the money, you can end up uh, finding the perpetrator. But now, is the way to locate, to spot that person? 
And then another question, could anyone use or take advantage of CryptoLocker to create their own version and then to ask for a ransom and to ask for that ransom in Bitcoins? Well, tracking the money, the money transaction, it is true, but to some extent, mafias are organized in a specific way. For instance, they have mules. They uh, just put a face, for instance, when they say, uh, make 3,000 euros per month if you make four bank transfers. That's a mule. That is to say, it's a person who receives all the money, then all that money through Western Union money, gram, or you name it, sends out that money to uh, um, heaven or to a foreign country, and then in that foreign country there is another mule taking out that money, and the money uh, go, ends up in the hands of the mafia. So there are two front people, two front people. That's what happens in real money in the real world. With regard to virtual money, it is very difficult to uh, track, to track uh, that money. And the last question, oh sorry, I cannot remember. Oh, crypto lockers. So if another person says, okay, now I'm going to change that crypto locker and I'm going to change the wallet and I'm going to distribute it somewhere else. Well, the trickiest part, so to speak, is that mafias or those who develop this type of malware often provide support and they go and say, okay, I generated a crypto locker for you. And then I also give you support, just in case uh, there are some uh, troubles. So it is not that they give you the code and you use it. Yes, well, this is behind all that. We just have mafias. That's the way they operate. And yes, I'd like to share. Well, well, regarding my experience with Incive and with some of our clients that got crypto locker we contacted in Cibe, uh, in Cibe to encrypt those services and i have to say that i have been very successful hello good afternoon talking about crypto locker there is a vaccination there crypto prevents how useful is that vaccine well, I just don't know. I know, I know though, that there are good tools, good elements that are um, that perform very well. So, some antiviruses manufacturers do not, if they cannot certify a signature, they set it out to a lab with reverse engineers. In, unless they give you, they certify it as the right one, they don't let you go through. Then there are other solutions such as those of Jago. It's an anti ransom In, let us say, in Trump directories, if you detect any changes or any encryption of the files, you send out a warning, you stop the computer, then you dump the memory acting on that file, and then you shut it down to stop the encryption. And last, from IBM Path, they proposed a solution which is a filter driver and then it points at a number of uh, directories. I don't know whether you're aware of Latch. This is a Telefonica solution. It is kind of, uh, yes, it's a Latch. It is either open or closed. That driver is in sync with Latch. So for instance, you have a directory with photos, you uh, upload all your photos, and then with the closed Latch, you allow that directory to be written. And when you finish, uh, uploading all your photographs, you close the latch. So therefore, it is not longer open to be written on. So these are the solutions that are being proposed in that regard. But there are several of them, several solutions now. Right, hello. As a regular user who doesn't want to put a risk, the, that, uh, this hard disk of ransomware, if when I navigate, if I browse, I use a virtual machine, what happens if he, it gets encrypted? Shall I delete it? I will open up another one. Well, this is not a bad practice. However, the servers of VMs are also vulnerable. 
so that could also be the case so therefore this is quite recommendable when it comes to browsing you use a virtual machine when you finish your browsing then you delete it and then you restore your computer to the initial state but careful careful the virtual machine doesn't have all those files where are you can you provide us with any addresses where we can uh, identify efficiently the malware that may may affect us so for me it is difficult to identify is this these variants of crypto locker or you name it and then is it recommendable for us to keep the infected files just in case we find a solution for that variant of malware well the issue of identification i don't know whether you're aware of the site of virus total every time you upload it they uh, have a different name each brand gives them a different name so safeguarding or keeping the files yes in case you find a solution that is absolutely recommendable because it's been proven over time that password or uh, panels including keys of infected users were recovered over time so if for whatever reason police and mantles uh, crypto locker network that uh, caused the uh, harm on you yes uh, you may find you may find a solution to your problem later on and in there so if you do a partition in your hard disk and then you download the files from the internet you keep them there with trick files and then you move them to your current uh, file what you work if CryptoLocker were to be enabled, would it activate everything that you have in that partition or everything that you have on your hard disk? Well, CryptoLocker, when activated, uh, encrypts everything it finds, whether it is hard disk uh, D or network one or uh, something with a password, whatever finds, whatever finds. That's the objective, to infect as much as possible. Hello, good afternoon. When you encrypt with CryptoLocker, I think that the password has to be in the equipment. We have that time and space to locate the password. Once it is fully encrypted, the password is deleted. It is the actual CryptoLocker that deletes it, isn't it? Am I right? Yes, you are right. However, some versions and or future versions will not encrypt all the information with the same key. And that's why Diago Solution, the anti ransom with Trump directories, when they detect someone is writing in there, it dumps the memory of that process to find out whether the password is there. Well, when you do the dumping, when you do the dumping, could you find the password? Yes, yes, you could find. You can find the uh, key or the password. With yes, by analyzing the memory of that process, you could find the password, provided it is the same key in all the directories. Good. If there are no more questions, thank you very much for your time and for your attention.